All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've been doing this web webinar series for quite a while, but this is the first time, uh, and thanks to Rob, actually, your suggestion that we're doing it in a hybrid format, and most importantly, a format that involves food and drink. Uh, so that's always better than, than not having food and drink. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Rob speak today from Macro Logistics, who's gonna talk about a really big uh, merger that's happening in intermodal freight. So Rob, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Mike. And, uh, before I get started, I wanna uh, thank everyone that uh, made this possible. So uh, Loyola Chicago, uh, also the support from the Traffic Club of Chicago. We're having a joint career fair here on November 1st. Um, so please, please come out for that. Oh, something out. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. I think the uh, advice I got from my wife is that I uh, need to talk slower. So if I'm talking too fast, just wave at me and I'll slow down. Uh, and louder. Louder too. Okay. I'm <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm, my name is Rob Liss. I'm a vice president at Mac Logistics. We're a direct provider of intermodal service on the CPKC and the BNSF and the largest independent agency of Armstrong Transport Group. I'm also a, a proud alumni. I'm excited, I'm excited to speak to you all today about the CPKC merger. It's a $31 billion transaction made in December of 2021 and completed in April of this year. You guys hear me okay? I'm wondering if folks online can't hear me so well. Oh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. you just have to man. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, four minutes. Well, now the clicker. How many times have I doing here? There, oh, there we go. There. All right. So, uh, believe it or not, I'm the guy in the teal hoodie. Uh, this is what uh, 12 years in supply chain does to you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was not a supply chain major at Loyola. Uh, I graduated with a double major in English and economics from the School of Arts and Sciences. I'm the uh, literal poster boy. Um, quick point of housekeeping, show of hands, who's familiar with the term intermodal? Got a room full of intermodal people, that's great. Uh, intermodal is a rail service meant to compete with over the road trucking. Intermodal means a shipment is loaded into a container and moved truck, rail, truck to delivery. It's the most common kind of rail service and what we'll focus on today. If you're a visual learner, you can scan the QR code in the center of the screen for a video of one of our boxes being lifted onto a chassis and driven to a rail yard. Another quick housekeeping point, if you'd like to connect with me, uh, please scan the QR code on the top right. Uh, don't worry if you don't snag it, we'll toss it back up at the end of the presentation. You're gonna see some QR codes throughout. Those will usually provide you with a direct link to whatever numbers I'm citing or um, anything else. So here we have the first and last golden spikes. The image on the left, you probably recognize from your middle school history books. It's a painting of Leland Stanford, the namesake of Stanford University, driving in the ceremonial Golden Spike, which completed the world's first transcontinental railroad in 1869. The image on the right is from earlier this year. This is now CPKC CEO Keith Creel, driving in a Golden Spike in Kansas City, Missouri. This signals the, this signaled the establishment of North America's first transnational railroad. That's to say the only railroad that truly runs north-south from Mexico through the United States and coast to coast in Canada. The image on the right doesn't look as iconic as the image on the left, but I assure you it will be just as historically significant. Canadian Pacific's $31 billion purchase of the Kansas City Southern is the most important infrastructure investment in North America in the last 150 years. The QR code on the right is a blog post I wrote about this merger. This presentation is really an expansion on that post. Uh, this presentation is set up in three parts. One, why is intermodal important? Two, some railroad history. And three, the unique position of the CPKC. So why are railroads important? There's a lot of answers to that, but I think the best way to think about it is to really contextualize rail service with all the buzz around autonomous and electric class eight semi-trucks. There are safety reasons that you want to can cite to invest in autonomous technology, and there are climate change implications for electric trucks. And I promise you we're gonna get into both of those but I want you to put your economist hat on now and just focus on the numbers. According to the American Trucking Association, last year, the US spent over $940 billion on trucking, 80% of the nation's total freight bill. Also from the ATA, the pie chart on the left shows the breakdown of what the marginal cost is for each dollar of that revenue. Intermodal service is important for the same reasons investors think autonomous trucks and electric trucks are important, labor and fuel costs. 
In total, 68 cents of every dollar spent on trucking last year can be attributed to labor or fuel. Simple math, let's round up to a trillion dollars. Probably a little low since we're also thinking of Mexico and Canada. As labor is 40% of trucking costs, you're looking at a $400 billion market. Same for fuel, $280 billion market, both of which are grown. Investment is coming to those areas because that's the money is, full stop. Capital is chasing that share of spend. That being said, if you really care about the reasons outside of the pure economics for investing in these markets, the environment and road safety, doubling down on intermodal is almost certainly the better investment, an investment the largest trucking companies are already doubling down on. I'm going to share this quote from a Boston Consulting Group study last year. No form of mass transport has more potential to aid in the fight against global warming than rail. It uses 80% less energy than trucks per ton of freight carried and holds a four to one advantage over cars in terms of emissions intensity. Rail is the most fuel efficient form of mass, tran mass land transit. A steel wheel on a steel rail is far more energy efficient than rubber on asphalt. A single locomotive engine can pull several hundred times the load capacity of a single over the road truck. The chart on the left is from the International Energy Agency. It's from a modeling exercise they did on carbon emissions in 2020. It's pretty hard to see, but rail transportation emissions is that tiny purple line on the bottom. The QR code on the right is the source of that graph. It's pretty nice, it's interactive, you can hover over it. Um, the QR code on the left is to a carbon calculator from the EPA that'll help convert those emissions numbers into things that are a little easier to wrap your head around. I encourage you to do your own math, but I'll give you some numbers to start. According to the IEA, in 2019, trucking accounted for 1.6 billion metric tons of carbon emissions. That's the equivalent of supplying electricity to over 201 million homes a year, or roughly the combined housing units of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. If you were to take 5% of that number, so 80 million tons of carbon, and move that same amount of freight via rail, so 80% more efficiently, it would have the same net positive effect as planting over a billion trees. The numbers are insane. That same study projects that sustainable railroad practices could effectively eliminate the usage of fossil fuels in transportation in rail transportation as early as 2050. And we'll get to that a little bit on the next slide. These gains and the existing rail infrastructure that enables them can't be replicated with electric class eight semi trucks, especially when you consider the investments that you'd have to happen to electricity grid to make those trucks practical. The potential $280 billion fuel market electric trucks are trying to capture, growing the intermodal market share by 5% would have a larger positive environmental impact than tens of thousands of electric trucks on the road. If you want less pollution, if you want North American energy independence, you want more and more shipments to go rail. And we have a tremendous amount of room to grow when it comes to converting truck to rail shipments. We haven't begun to get tap into the deep well of intermodal efficiency gains, and the railroads will be the first one to tell you this. I'm going to grab water for a second. Just the exciting slides, nothing on it. Uh, the question you're probably asking yourself is, if rail's so green, why haven't I heard about it? Part of it is a major perception issue on the issue of the, part of it is a major perception issue for the railroads. Prior to intermodal being the number one commodity moved by rail, the top spot was held by coal. It's far safer to move hazardous chemicals by rail than truck, but when derailments happen, which are very rare, the impact is outsized. You can see that in the chemical spills in Ohio and Norfolk Southern earlier this year, or the more recent derailment in Nebraska and the Union Pacific. One of the electives I took at Loyola for my econ degree was environmental economics. It was an elective for me, but it was a required course for environmental science majors. The test would have questions like, what's the optimum level of pollution for X factory? And the environmental science majors really couldn't get past the answer wasn't zero. I got an A in that class, and I'm sure a lot of my classmates were flunked me. <laughs> Uh, you have to be a guy who thinks the right answer, the right goal is zero, in order to have the moral authority on climate change. There's an argument to be made that shipping more freight intermodal is a moral imperative. It's not an argument I can make, but I'm really going to focus. I'm really going to focus on the economics. But it's an argument that should be made. I hope one of you in this room can be the one to make it and elevate the discourse. The railroad's been trying to state their case on sustainability, and they have the hard science to back it up. You can follow each one of these QR codes, and you can pull up years of sustainability reports by every railroad. These slides will be available after the talk. I encourage you to look at all the work uh, and make for the railroads and make your own decisions. If you care about climate change, you should be screaming from the rooftops to move more freight on the rail. There is no lower hanging fruit in significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As an aside, uh, I threw another QR code up here this morning. 
Um, there's a hydrogen truck, the CDKC debuted. It's really cool. It's actually pulling customer freight right now and is zero emissions. Um, if you pull up that the thing, we'll pull you to Twitter. There's two things that are there. One, it's an awesome train. Two, I think 5,000 people have seen that post. There, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here and people need to grab. So the second side of this coin, why autonomous trucks is a little more complicated to answer. But give slide, sorry. The biggest reason to make a move to autonomous trucks is the reality that semi trucks are really dangerous. Now, in my opinion, truck drivers are very safe. It's the trucks themselves that are dangerous. These are 80,000 pound death machines. The QR codes will take you to two studies, one from the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety, the other from the National Highway Safety Administration. Over 4,700 people died in accidents involving large trucks in 2021. Large trucks are defined as vehicles weighing 10,000 pounds or more. That number is from the Insurance Institute. The number from the National Highway Safety Administration is higher by 1,000 deaths. You can follow the link to the QR codes to both reports. I'm not sure where the discrepancy comes from, but my guess would be commercial vehicle accidents versus total accidents. If you're more of a hands-on learner, next time you're on the highway, just count the number of billboards of lawyers advertising specifically for truck accidents. They are everywhere. It's both a tragedy and big business. The reason why I say trucks themselves are dangerous and not truck drivers is to look at where the impacts are occurring. 84% of all truck accident impact points are in the front or rear of a vehicle. The primary safety issue isn't one of human error, it's one of physics. It's really hard to stop 80,000 pounds of anything moving 50 to 60 miles an hour. And it's a losing battle if you run into a truck. It doesn't matter if it's a robot driving the car or not, a class eight truck on the road is by its very nature dangerous and not enough regular motorists account for this. Drive on the Dan Ryan and count how many people are cutting off semis in the road. That the death count isn't higher is a testament to the skill of the men and women behind the wheel. Speaking of those men and women, the other impact to consider is that autonomous trucks are a political non-starter. Trucking is the number one employer in 28 states. Most driving companies operate 10 trucks or fewer, and only a handful operate more than 100. If you were talking about small business in America, or if you're talking about blue collar jobs in America, you are talking about trucking. It's a $400 billion labor market, but there are a lot of questions about how to capitalize on that market that don't have great answers. How do you regulate a driverless truck? How do you turn liability in the event of an accident? How do you retrain the millions of Americans you put out of work? And how do you replace revenue loss from payroll taxes? Recently, the legislature of California provided their answer by banning driverless semi-trucks in the state. You don't. Then the governor vetoed that law, so Maybe you do. There's a lot of potential money in the autonomous semi-truck market. However, in terms of safety, the solution is clear. The less trucks on the road, the safer everyone else is. If you look at what the largest trucking companies are doing, the 0.3% with more than 100 trucks, they're leading the charge in taking drivers off the road by leaning more and more into their intermodal service offerings. So let's talk about the largest trucking firms in the country. What do they look like? Well, to me, they look like rail companies. The chart on the right is from J.B. Hunt's full earnings last year. Their intermodal segment was 48% of the revenue, but 64% of their operating income. Why is that? Because intermodal requires less labor, it consumes far less fuel, and can be priced relative to truckload costs. J.B. Hunt's an innovator in this space. If you look at the chart on the left, that occurred to see of Jason Hilsenbeck at loadmatchandrainage.com, who I, I think is on this call. Uh, you can see that J.B. Hunt now owns more animal equipment than all other class one railroads combined. They've also publicly committed to expanding their fleet by 40% in the next three to five years. In total, 76% of all intermodal containers are owned by entities other than the railroads. MAC is one of them. We're the smallest one of them. I do not want to, I want to send a quick aside. Intermodal shipping doesn't reduce the number of drivers. Actually, the opposite happens. It just reduces the number of driver miles. You still need one driver at origin, and one driver destination in a truck rail truck transit. At intermodal transit requires two drivers, a long haul driver over the road requires one. It's not gonna be a straight line pattern, but if intermodal shipping steals 5% market share away from trucking, not only would that be the same as planting a billion trees, it also would likely reduce highway fatalities by 5%, so roughly 235 people a year. And it would double the amount of drivers required to move a single shipment. It's the definition of a win-win-win scenario. The future of trucking isn't autonomous and it isn't electric, but it is green. The future of trucking is railroads. 
The importance of the CBKC and the focus of the rest of this talk is predicated on two principal beliefs. The first, the future of trucking is rail. And second, the future of trade is Mexico. In 2023, intermodal volumes, along with truckload volumes, are down year over year in every area except for one, Mexico. Mexico is growing volumes as the U.S. pulls out of China and near shores or French shores. Mexico already is the number one trade partner of the United States. Currently, the vast majority of U.S. trade with Mexico, around 85%, moves cross-border via truck. This growth in Mexican trade has propelled the KCS to have nearly doubled the compound annual growth rate of other railroads since 2010 and the merger with the CP will only accelerate it. In the next section, we'll, step, we'll take a step back and look at some of the historical context for this merger. Any quick questions, right? Oh, this talk, it makes me thirsty. Um, all right. So railroads are revolutionary. They fundamentally changed the way that we live and they drove America's expansion. The first locomotive was invented in 1796. For context, George Washington, maybe uh, eight. The first public railroad was opened in England in 1823. By 1860, Chicago, a city founded 23 years prior, a world away, would have 11 railroads, including the first land grant railroad. The rate of change is dizzying. In 1869, first transcontinental railroad. 100 years later, America puts a man on the moon. Parts of the Apollo mission had to be designed around the railroad track because it's the only way to move them. Containerization first appears in the 30s as trailer and flat car or rail pig freight. This explodes in 1956, and the same concept is taken to ships, utilizing stackable boxes without wheels. That same year, there were 127 Class 1 railroads. These are the largest railroads by revenue, and this is a sort of the golden period before a decline. In the 70s to the 80s were a period of government uh, intervention and eventually deregulation. Government regulation really spans a, year, a period of about 100 years. Things that made sense when the Interstate Commerce Commission was formed in 1877, when the alternative to train travel was a horse and buggy, no longer made sense in the disco era, when railroads are competing against interstate highway system for freight traffic and against rail airlines for passenger traffic. The U.S. government took over loss generating passenger travel by forming Amtrak in 1970. As scores of railroads continued to collapse in bankruptcy, they nationalized and combined those entities into Conrail, which was later privatized and is now largely the CSX and Norfolk Southern Railroads. 1980, President Jimmy Carter threw in the towel at the recommendation of the Interstate Commerce Commission, conceding the free market was better at regulating interstate commerce than Washington bureaucracy. The Staggers Act reduced, re reduced regulatory controls over the railroads and effectively ended the ICC. In 2012, the number one commodity shipped was intermodal boxes for the first time ever. Those, again, are the industrial steel bo size boxes filled with general cargo, first invented in the 50s. Prior to this, first commodity was coal. The rate of change is dizzying. The most important thing shipped on the rail today didn't exist for the first 150 years of railroad. With the CPKC merger, there are now six class ones. So looking backwards, we've gone circular and that there's certainly a lot more track now than there was in the very, very <laughs> early days of the rail. But there are it's fewer the in North America now than there were in Chicago in 1860. I think we're gonna mute the chat here. I'm gonna drink some more water. Oh, we got a crowd. Okay. All right. Work is still work. Uh, yeah. Try it now. All right. Awesome. All right. So, what makes the CPKC merger so important? It really starts with the constituent pieces. The CPKC now owns the Panama Canal Railway, a railroad that's completed more than 50 years prior to the Panama Canal. It's not that important piece, not that important of a piece compared to the other sections of North America, but it is more than an historical footnote. Currently, Panama is facing a 20 year drought. As part of the canal is flooded with fresh water from a lake, this has limited the number of ships that can sail through it. In addition, the rate at which container ships grow in size has outpaced the rate of expansion of the canal. The newest, largest container ships are referred to as post Panamax in size literally ships too big to cross the Panama Canal. Container traffic will still go through Panama, but increasingly it will go over land from the Pacific to the Atlantic on the Panama Canal Railway, or through Mexico at port of entry at Lazaro Cardenas, and I need to apologize to all my Spanish teachers that I butchered that, on continuous CPKC track. It's a really important port, and I will 
mispronounce it several times this, pres this uh, presentation. Uh, the KCS is a more straightforward American entity. It existed largely as a conglomerate for most of its history. It acquired railroads, the valuable land underneath those railroads, and branched into technology and financial markets with some great success. In the mid-90s, it acquired various pieces of Mexico and Panama and spun off its other divisions to help fund capital expenditures. The CP was the first transnational railway in Canada. Uh, unlike their American counterparts, the Canadian Rail is still involved in passenger travel and also still on ships. The CP is a source of national pride in Canada. A lot of Canadian families, especially in Western Canada, can trace their ancestry back to the CP. They were recruited to immigrate in Canada. They traveled in on CP ships. They traveled on that by, by CP train and they bought land to settle on from the CP. The CP is a strong traditional culture and uh, it's a great company that we like very much. Prior to the merger, the CP and the KCS were the two smallest of the class one railroads. After the merger, they're still the smallest, but they have arguably the most important network. The three biggest ports in North America by trade volume are one, Los Angeles, driven by Asian container traffic, two, Laredo, driven by cross-border over-the-road freight, and three, Chicago, driven by air cargo. Two of these ports are touched directly by the CPKC, while the third, Los Angeles, has virtually the same rail track mileage to Chicago as the CPKC does from the port of Lazaro Cardenas. Over time, Lazaro Cardenas will pull volume out of Long Beach, driven by growth in Mexico, but also from diversions to the Panama Canal. Chicago is important because it's the only city where every class one railroad connects. The CPKC is unique, and that's the only railroad that connects directly with every other railroad, both in Chicago and at least one point outside of Chicago. As part of the regulatory clearance and the merger, the CPKC is obligated to maintain those connections. The result is that the CPKC can both route to Chicago as a central hub and around it. In terms of cities, the CPKC connects eight of the 25 largest in North America by population, including the largest, Mexico City. In terms of cultural relevance, the US, Mexico, and Canada are jointly hosting the next World Cup. Eight of the 15 host cities are connected by the rail. Every city outside North America, in addition to Houston, Dallas, and Kansas City. These are dynamic, growing locations that are ready to show themselves off to the world. This all being said, having the best track doesn't mean you have the best network. In the final section, we're going to go through some of the unique things of the CPAC operates and how they're going to drive the company forward. So the most important thing to know is about the CPKC is PSR, Precision Scheduled Railroading. This means running trains faster, safer, and more efficiently. That means more units per train in order to compete with over-the-road traffic. The founder of PSR is Hunter Harrison, CEO of the Illinois Central, Canadian National, the Canadian Pacific, and very briefly, though very profitably, the CSX. It's a busy slide and the quotes kind of bury at the bottom, but if you read it, if we take a 5% share of the highways, there's not a bank big enough to hold all the money the railroads would make. And you can look at the chart on the right and see what he did for the CSX cap. He added $12 billion in seven months before he untimely passing later that year. Harrison did the majority of his work at the CP, and the increase in share price was based on the idea that he would bring the success of PSR to the KCX. The CK, uh, CK, ugh. Harrison's top lieutenant and planned successor at CP, Keith Creel, is the CEO I showed you a picture of at the start of this presentation, driving a golden spike into the ground in Kansas City. PSR has one goal, convert over-the-road shipments to intermodal. Moving through Mexico, the cost and speed advantages PSR already enjoys are magnified. Transportation is very simple, moving from points A to B, known as the head haul or revenue generating miles. It gets really complicated when you have to move back from B to A, known as the back haul, which may or may not generate revenue. In transportation, all miles are cost producing miles. This effect is compounded in Mexico due to cabotage laws. A Mexican carrier can take a shipment from Mexico to the U.S. and from the U.S. to Mexico, but can't move the shipment within the U.S. even if it gets them most of the way back home. The end result is this complicated diagram on the left. It's generally more cost efficient to use three carriers with three different levels of operating authority, handling the freight several times than for a single continuous movement. This model both minimizes the risk of running empty miles for the trucking companies and distributes that risk across three separate firms. Compared to the image on the right, looks just as complicated. This is how intermodal shipping works in Mexico, but there are two key, two key differences. First, customs is cleared before the container is loaded onto rail. This allows the train to move continuously through the border and prevents log jams at border crossings. 
The CPKC is currently expanding their infrastructure in Laredo to add a second rail bridge, allowing them to move traffic north and southbound simultaneously. Second, the CPKC has an absolute cost advantage on the empty miles. Empty shipping containers can be stacked double high and moved in a train in excess of three miles long. To move the same amount of volume empty back, you need hundreds of drivers per train equivalent. The impact of PSR in Mexico is to create a transportation product that will have fewer touches, faster, more predictable transit, and at a lower cost, competing against the truckload service. We're about six months in this merger and the CPKC is posting times from Mexico and Chicago of around five days and beating that transit. I expect those times to improve as parts of the CPKC better integrate and more processes streamline. The final piece I wanna to touch on is safety and security. When thinking about safety, I wanna think in terms of derailments. The CP has been the safest railroad in North America for the last 17 years straight, and I'll bet you good money they make it 18. I think the best argument for security on rail is that, oh, sorry, jump ahead. When thinking about security, this probably conjures up some concerns about the cartels. This is a very real problem in doing business in Mexico. I think the best argument for security on rail is that while it's relatively easy to hijack a truck, it's almost impossible to hijack a train. When a box is loaded onto a train, it either sits in a well car like this image, surrounded by four feet of steel, or it's stacked on top, suspended 15 feet in the air. The train does not stop outside of secure locations. The railroads have their own police force, and they'll even put armed guards on the train in high-risk areas. It's not a perfect system, nothing is, but cross-border and modal offers a lot of security. Uh, you can scan this QR code, and it'll actually bring you to the CPC line. They've got a lot more stuff than I, I mentioned in the talk. So what's next? I can't answer this question for you, but I can answer it for my company. In the last 24 months, MACA legally became a truckload carrier. We secured direct contracts with the BNSF and the CPKC. We purchased a small fleet of temperature controlled units, and we signed a contract with Oracle to help us manage our growth. We go live with Oracle OTM in January. Everything goes to plan. We'll be a case study for them. We'll present at their Cloudwork conference next year in front of 30,000 people. But why we're really here is that we believe in the power of what 5% can do and we think 5% is probably too low, right? If you convert 5% to from, from over the road to rail, it's the same as planting a billion trees. It's gonna have 235 less funerals a year. You're gonna double the number of trucking jobs per transaction. And most importantly, you're gonna need to build new banks to hold all the money. <laughs> we could not be more all in on the CPKC and what this merger means to the future of North America. We sincerely hope that you progress along your careers outside Loyola, you also ride that train with us. Thank you. Uh, well, that was, of course, very interesting. And of course, there's time for questions. I, I mean, we also have still food and drink, but uh, anyone have questions? I have some, of course, I always do, but. All right, I'll ask a question. Why hadn't this merger happened before? Um, so re regulatory clearance. the. Uh, CP at one point tried to buy the Norfolk Southern. You can still find some like documents on that online. Um, but you went from 127 railroads to six. Yeah. Um, for that, it was 127 down to seven. Yeah. So railroads tend towards monopoly. There's a lot of uh, regulatory concern. That's the whole reason that the ICC was formed in the 1870s yeah. for that reason. Um, so that's why it's taken so long to do it. Um, and more importantly, it's the only two railroads that really could have merged. So they were both independently the smallest. After merging, they're still smaller than every other class one railroad. Yeah. Um, there is an additional railroad that would qualify as a class one, the Ferromex inside of Mexico, but it's not qualified that because it has no US track rights. Okay. So there could be some more consolidation, but that's probably 10, 15 years down the road. Yep. Yeah. Well, this is very interesting. And as a clean air advocate, I'm I'm almost convinced, but, um, but let me almost. Ask, almost. What, there's a lot of controversy about super long trains, like, you know, blocking railroad tracks so that the, the ambulance can't get around. There's also controversy about how many conductors on a train and how many train engineers. How does the precision fit into having less staff on a train? So I think it depends on how you apply PSR, right? So every railroad likes to say we're a PSR railroad because it, Wall Street really likes that. Um, I wanna say the CP is the best at it. They're really a pioneer in that space. Uh, the Norfolk Southern's not. So you look at the derailment in Ohio and, and not to throw them under the bus, they blame that on PSR. And, and really what you blame it on is just bad practices in terms of the railroad. If you're running it correctly, the CP is the safest. They, you know, 17 years straight, fewest derailments, everything else. So if you are doing it correctly and you're running the trains fast, you don't have that backlog. 
uh, the CSX had some uh, issues and they played uh, CSR with those extra long trains. Right. Um, I think part of that's because they just rolled in the strategy and it's an iterative process. It takes time to roll this out properly. I mean, but I know that because you live out that way, but in Berwyn or on my way to Maywood to the medical center, yeah. I've spent much time uh, at the railroad crossing and they're really long and then they back up. How do they know it's me? You're going to have to ask the Canadian That's the precision part. I know. You're going to have to ask the Canadian National that way. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hey, um, I'm Osmana Yusuf. I'm currently a student at College of Lake County. I work as a uh, shipping specialist in Echo Global Logistics. My, I have two questions, and it's regarding the uh, the intermodal versus truckload slide. Yeah. It compares. Sorry. Yeah. Right now, please. Yeah. From this slide, I could clearly tell the efficiency intermodal has. My question is that since at this as a shipment specialist, I always get calls from drivers saying that we're held back. We have a lot of inefficiencies, always held up at the border. So how exactly does intermodal differ from um from truck truckloads in regards to um customs clearance process? Yeah, so that's a great question. The uh, the customs clearance, they won't let the product on the train until it's cleared. So um, you think about in terms of inspections, to your point earlier about having uh, I think it's like two or three conductors on a train at a time, uh, that's how many people need to go through the board. That same amount of freight, it's the aspect the driver, the individual truck, plus the product. So in terms of, um, so there's two pieces there. The first is that before it's on the train, it's already cleared, they know it's coming through, there's a pre-approval process that's a little more streamlined. And the second is that you don't need to inspect, you know, 100 drivers if you're moving 100 boxes over the rail. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, and one more. Uh, so I also see that a standard load from a truck crossing the border takes about two to three drivers. And with those drivers, we always have complaints about a lot of hours, equipment breakdown, or even health issues. All that stuff is taken out of the way because again, a, tra a train doesn't stop. Yeah. So um, what challenges does intermodal face compared to truckload? Um, so it, again, it's a congestion issue. So well, it's it's slower than truckload in that truckload is going to go from A to B. Stuff goes back to the truck. Truck goes through. Intermodal, it's going to have to get to an initial rail yard. It could be um, interlined between two different places. There's a lot of congestion that happens, especially in Chicago, because it's where all the railroads meet. Um, so a lot of those delays come from going up from one rate from one rail line to another. Um, so that, that's kind of where a lot of the delays come from is just managing all the equipment once it gets to the terminal. The train itself is really fast. The processes of getting them unloaded, there's always room to get moved through that faster. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Rob, you've done us proud as the econ faculty. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I don't know much about this part of the logistics, but on the rails itself, first of all, are there costs of maintaining rails between Canada, US, and Mexico? Does it differ between states? And if there are any federal subsidies for the maintenance of the rails themselves, the instruct that you're talking about. So all the track is private. The railroads are responsible for maintaining that track. So that's why they're able to put that second bridge in Laredo. So instead of going to Congress and trying to get the money and appropriate and whatever, if they own the lands, they can put the track down. Historically, that's not always true. Um, there's about land grant railroads and things like that. I know that Dr. Daniel Bear is probably an expert in some of this, um, and uh, he could probably speak to it better than I could. Is that true in Mexico and Canada too? That they're private? Uh, yes, they're well, they're publicly traded, but they're they're responsible for the the tracks. They have a concern. They have a, right. Yes. So uh, again, yeah. he's he's a domain expert. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in 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 principle, you're correct. Yes. yes. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm the sales guy, so. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions over the chat. Yeah. Uh, we have, I've heard that many people, including a couple of class ones, have rejected PSR. Can you explain or maybe talk about why that might have been the case? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest of that is BNSF. So it's a company we also have a contract with. Um, BNSF doesn't own any equipment whatsoever. 
And that's part of the reason why J.B. Hunt, well, that's, well, that's not entirely true, but in principle, um, that's why J.B. Hunt has so many boxes. They move almost all of them on the NSF rail line. So if you're just running the trains and you're not worried about the boxes, there's not as much emphasis on PSR. You don't have to do it the same way. The other time is that if you don't have strong leadership driving PSR and driving continual improvements, um, you're going to have some problems. So uh, I'm, I've never met Hunter Harrison, but I know some people that have, and there's stories that will tell you of them getting phone calls at 2, 3 a.m. Why is my train delayed? Um, so there's, you know, a very, uh, it's a very traditional strong culture in the Canadian Pacific. Um, the uh, uh, part of that is, is make sure it's done properly, correctly. And it's just, it's a cultural fit. Some, some areas it's there, some areas it's not. Uh, we have there been news videos of train loads of northbound migrants in Mexico aiming across the U.S. border. Uh, which railroads in Mexico are they riding on and what's the security process they're aiming to control such flows of people? I, if you feel comfortable answering that, yeah, but yeah, if you don't, I understand. For sure. So that was in the news on Eagle Pass, Texas. That's in the Ferromex. So yeah. that's uh, um, the Mexican uh, railroad that would be a class one if they had U.S. trackage rights. Um, part of the issue is that because they have to stop at the border, they can't continuously through. Yeah. You're going to have those kind of bottlenecks where there's uh, opportunities for people to try to hop on and whatever. Um, the uh, In contrast, the CPKC moves at an average of five miles an hour through the border. Um, so it goes through um, like giant x-ray machines on steroids and they say hey we need to flag these boxes they'll stop the train briefly pull those boxes off and the train keeps going oh. so part of it is if you just run the trains faster and more consistently um it makes it really hard um you know uh there's a lot of things i would do jumping on a moving train is not one of them um, <laughs> and i think that's true for a lot of people um ah our rail infrastructure is old and privately maintained by the railroads themselves yeah. Uh, any thoughts on infrastructure improvements needed or funding changes needed to afford all this extra capacity? Yeah, so that's that's on the railroads. So the um, if you look at uh, the KCS, when they spun off um, two billion dollar businesses, they did that to fund infrastructure improvement largely in Mexico. Um, so the railroads are all very profitable. Um, they make a ton of money and they do plow billions every year into maintaining their own track. Um, so the, uh, I think the railroads are on the hook for it. I think they do a good job for it. And I think if it's in their own self-interest to expand, um, they'll do it. Um, I think the only time the government should get involved is like, Hey, we need to use them in a domain or something. Yeah. And, and that's the case. But other than that, it's their private, their private companies and they should be on the hook for it. Is my opinion. So maybe following up when you talk about the 5% number, yeah. right? I appreciate that's an aggregate number, but is there 5% is the capacity there to take that 5%? Yes. Yeah. So the, uh, last two years, there's, um, a lot of capacity has entered the market, right? So 2019 leading into 2020 people forget about it, but it was prior to this year, it was the year of the largest number of trucking bankruptcies. Yeah. So you had a, a bunch of outflows of trucking companies, a bunch of people idling equipment. Then 2020 happened. There's no drivers. Yeah. And but the one thing you could have is these boxes. There's all these congestion that happened. A lot of trucking companies added capacity. A lot of rail companies added capacity. Um, Amazon has 20,000 boxes um, of their own that they didn't exist uh, two years ago. So there's a lot of capacity that's not being tapped in. And a lot of that is being idled, um, just stacked on the side right now because volumes are down every year in every area except for Mexico. Is the main limiting factor capacity-wise the boxes? Um, the boxes are, are part of it. Um, and then it's also conductors. So yeah. okay. um, the uh, I think the starting conductor salary is $85,000 a year. I, you can read that on the CPKC Twitter. Um, you get a great pension. Uh, it's a great job. But it's like trucking. It's tough because you're going to be at one, uh, on the rail at one point. You're going to get off at another. You're going to be away from your family for an extended yeah. period. It's just the nature of the work. Um, so it's, it's a difficult job, um, but it's something that uh, pays very well. There's demand for it. Um, it's, it's just uh, um, so that I think the, the labor is a big part of it. Sure. Um, then also the, the boxes. Okay. Uh, so we have a, okay, what impact do you think the next U.S. presidential election will play in the aforementioned nearshoring in Mexico, the CPKC merger, and the efficiencies that the CPKC can create in 24 to 28? Uh, so I bring have, out your crystal ball. I, 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 I know, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I can I can make something up, but I won't uh, it's embarrass myself. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, I have no idea um, on that. Okay. Yeah. Please. I, I can okay. add a little to this. Sure. Um, uh, this was a good merger. If you look at it from uh, a network perspective, it's spot on. 
There's one fly in the ointment, and that is the concession from the Mexican side comes up in 2027. Yeah, well, that's a problem for 2027. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the context, yeah. I, I, yeah, there, there's, uh, you know, especially as volumes grow and, and whatever, there, there's going to be, um, there's a lot of geopolitics involved. Um, but I think that the, I really like our chances negotiating and getting a good deal with Mexico and Canada more than I like our chances in negotiating with China um, or, or other actors that are oceans away. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure everyone appreciates what the concession is. Could you talk about that or explain it in a little bit more detail? I think Dan could Or maybe you could. Yeah, yeah, I could. Here's, I'll compress it into a paragraph or less. It boils down to a country owns track. They own the infrastructure. When they own the infrastructure, they say, this is a strategic asset. We're not selling it to anybody. However, we will lease it to whoever is the best candidate for operating the road of maximizing, minimizing risk. That's the first thing. They want to minimize risk. The second is they want to maximize revenue and the attendant multiplier effects of economic development. And so that's what they, if we don't want the risk we don't want the hassle and the bureaucracy and everything that goes with operating the railroad. That's your baby. You handle that. However, we want a little back for our investment in the infrastructure. That's called a concession. That's it. Look at this. Yeah. So it's more than a paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I just wanted what when when I ride the Amtrak train occasionally. What what is the relation? Who so their Amtrak doesn't own any track? Is that right? Yeah. So I'm I'm also not an expert. At, forget I know Amtrak. I don't know so much. I did take the right the train down to uh, New Orleans one time. That was fun. Canadian National. Well, actually, and I used to go down to Springfield for lobbying, and you know, so you know, the train was always left on time from Chicago and was seven hours late coming back. But so so you don't know so. The, but so all, is all that, I guess my question is all the track privately owned in June Almost the only exception is on the Northeast border from Boston yeah. going down to DC, they own it. And from approximately, I think it's Porter, Indiana, East to Michigan, Kalamazoo, I think it's gone beyond, former NS territory. Okay. They, that's what the 110 mile an hour territory. They own that. But most of when Amtrak operates, they have a, a, a grandfathered agreement said when, when Amtrak came in, what happened is the railroads wanted to offload passenger service because it was there's a lot of conversations that are adult beverage material. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But boils down to for the ability to for the class one railroads to shed themselves of the responsibility of operating passenger trains. They said, the government said, okay, give us your cars, your locomotives, but, and, and you operate a passenger railroad, but we have priority on your system. So they are tenants, they, Amtrak, are tenants on the respective former operators of the passenger service. That's how it works. Yeah, but I, yeah. Yeah. So I think question. really quickly, I think in back, I think you've had your hand. Yeah, quick question. Yeah, in light of Amazon slash uh, intermodal, and this is kind of out of the blue, I'm not from this area, but is George Jetson in our future in any way? <laughs> Are, is drone technology going to do anything wild and crazy in the future? Uh, I mean, that might be a better question for, George, for yeah. Aaron or the CPKC, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, or in the air cargo area, I suppose. Yeah. Um, there's a very interesting case study in Cincinnati with that case Okay. Yeah. There's it's an exciting time to be in in freight and logistics. There's there's a lot of innovation coming into the space. Question and I might not have heard you correctly, but did you mention CBKC owns most of its boxes? So CBKC uh does not. They're part of a container pool um that uh, the UP and uh Anyway, they got kicked out of it. So uh, <laughs> the, when the merger came through, uh, the other railroads were not particularly happy about that. Um, so the CPKC took their boxes out of that pool, rebranded them. They additionally have a thousand uh, reefer containers uh, that they run. Um, but the uh, that's one of the reasons that we're, we are so aligned with the CPKC is that 
we have a small amount of boxes, but bringing those boxes has some value. We're not JV Hunt, you know, we don't have a hundred thousand growing, um, but it's something that the um, the roads in general don't want to own the, but don't they don't want to own the boxes? Yeah. This, if they don't own the box, then they can charge for it. When they own the box, they can't. Um, so in general, you're going to see the railroads own less and less in oil boxes and more trucking companies, um, Walmart, Amazon, <clears throat> they'll own the boxes. And just trying to sort of tag on and follow on. So just kind of I'm curious how that interacts with like, you know, like the big like data you know, less like you know, talking about like Triton or Textaner, et cetera. Like are, are those entities mostly lending for like like transocean shipping or do they yeah, again, I, I I own boxes. I I'm not an expert in the in that in that area. But um I think in in general, uh, you know, it's a um it's an evolving marketplace for sure. So that's my good non-answer. So <laughs> think, uh, uh, why don't we go in back? Oh, first, yeah, that's hey, Rob, good to see you again. Hey, hey Carlos. <laughs> I just want to add a few thoughts. Um, as a lifelong truckload over the road person, I think you know, I just want to think the perspective why this is happening. And given that you have that slide up there, the cross-border situation and everything that's happening with the trade wars with China and how supply chains are reestablishing in Mexico. But I see this slide, it's very interesting because I, I think the, the inefficiencies that, that are on the truckload shipping side are crazy, right? Yeah. So to, just to have it on a train that at the border, that makes it so much more efficient. Um, and, you know, I also want to mention, I, I love the, the fact that you're talking about sustainability because yes, one train versus X amount of trucks is, is a huge difference, right? And I heard a lot of people mention the, the security issue, people jumping on trains. I don't, I don't see that as a, I don't see it as exclusive to rail. I mean, that happens on, on trucks or cars or horses, whatever you think about. You know, it's it's just the uh, you know the, the current situation that's happened. Right? It's not exclusive to that. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, intermodal shipping, I think, minimizes risk. Um, so uh, for for us and for Maca's business. Um, a lot of it's South Texas. So I have the office here in Chicago. Our main office is all along the border um, outside of McAllen. Um, and you look at our freight mix, a lot of it comes from Mexico or goes into Mexico. And we only handle that U.S. domestic portion. So we want to get the full part of that transaction. How do we do that? We looked at a lot of other options. And we, for us, we, we looked at Intermodal as the one least amount of risk, um, the one that we thought would be the best fit for us and the one that I think we best to, to sell to our customers. So thank you for the thanks. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the routes and the markets that are effectively served. So is CPKC, do you parallel what BSNF covers or do you really go widely yeah. away from that? So um, that's a good question. So prior to the merger, the BNSF and the KCS had a strategic partnership that is steel wheel interchange in Houston. Um, so the KCS line... Uh, if you wanted to go to Dallas, you had to go through Houston um, to Louisiana and then back through along the track. So there's all these different interchange points that get efficient. Um, the problems of the railroads then have to split that money between themselves and people don't like to share. Um, but as part of the regulatory approval, they have to keep all these options open. Um, so the BNSF and the UP, um, they largely service the West Coast ports or West Coast area. So from LA up to Portland and then all the way to Chicago, uh, the NS, the CSX opposite on the East Coast, um, the CN across. So they really, uh, they try to have duopolies on both areas. So you have an option whether you want BNSF or UP. Um, but if you want to service the country, you have to have contracts with multiple carriers, uh, multiple rail lines. And you, you don't want to burn those relationships. So I, I said some salty things about the NS and the CSX that I, I hope no one uh, remembers <laughs> earlier. So is it the same um, for, I mean, now that we have um, considerably more near shoring in Mexico, and you mentioned Chicago being a recipient or center for distribution, does the Mexico traffic that ends up in Chicago like parallel the Mississippi River and barge traffic? Or yeah, well, barge traffic is interesting because you get so much more weight on the barge. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, you know, some droughts early in the year that, that slowed that down. 
Um, but it is similar in that they have this big flow. And then from Chicago to the Central Point, you can then truck it out to a lot of different areas. And that's uh, the, the CPKC is running two daily service trains, um, one to Chicago and one to Dallas. Um, so they really see Chicago as kind of that main area. We're going to run that train every day. We're going to get that um, volume in there. Um, to the uh, kind of go back to that, that 5% share. And then um, the uh, uh, at JOC a couple of weeks ago, um, the, there's a VP over at the CBK, the KC that spoke, and his goal is for 50% of share from Mexico to go rail. Um, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense because if you're looking at that near shoring and that friend shoring, if you're building a factory, if you're building a supply chain, it's really easy to build in, well, hey, I'm going to move that on rail. It's cheaper. It's, it's more, like, it, it's, it makes a lot more sense versus like, hey, I'm going to build this factory and I'll find some trucks. Um, it's something that you can kind of build in programmatically from as soon as you uh, start putting the factory in the ground. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of growth, um, you know, by by design um, as part of that. Uh, yeah, Richard. Hi, I'm Richard. Uh, I'm a freshman here studying supply chain. Uh, I'm wondering about the hydrogen fuel cell trains because that's a new technology. How mm -hmm. I know that sounds very dreamy in the sense of like the. Uh, um, global warming aspect, but how? What are the finances of the whole hydrogen train thing? All right. So I, uh, I was not kidding in that I put this this QR code in this morning. So I, uh, there, there is a, um, you know, I, please scan it and look at it. It goes straight to the CPKC social media team, and they have a guy talking about, hey, we took a train, we retrofitted it, we put hydrogen fuel cell on it, we tested it, um, and really goes through it. Um, it's really new. I mean, they're still testing that out. I don't know any financials that come through it. And I think if the CPKC did have it, um, they, they wouldn't necessarily share it. Um, but the uh, it, it is really cool. Um, what was know, their motivation? Um, well, part of it is if you get to true net zero, sure. right? So um, the Union Pacific has a program where they will sell themselves as uh, net carbon neutral. They'll buy carbon credits offset. Yeah. It's a lot cheaper for them to buy those credits than a truckload company. Um, and also the, a lot of California traffic, things like that. Um, but also, you know, in the slide, you can't really see it, yeah. but uh, these dotted lines is sort of like, hey, by 2040, you know, motorcycles should be electric. By 2050, rail should be, you know, relatively mission free if you invest in the right technology, right? Is what this this test does. So I looked at that and like, like 2050 sounds cool. I'd love to see it. And then the next day I, I saw that thing. And I'm like, maybe we're closer than we think. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it's, again, it's, you know, but the problem with bringing that same technology to trucks is you got to build, you know, hundreds of engines <laughs> um, with a train. It's a much smaller pool. It's a much smaller, simpler problem to solve on a relative basis. Okay. okay, so as I'm learning with you from truckload <laughs> going to intermodal, um, so the backhaul, is it simpler as, you know, you have your truck and you're trying to get it back, um, you know, to the origin state or whatever, is it the same way with uh, the intermodal or there are special steps? Yeah, so, so that's the reason why the, the railroads want people to own the boxes and not them, is so that we're on the hook for sort of balancing the network um, in terms of the rate structures and how they're set up. The railroads know there's huge trade imbalance between Mexico and the U.S. There's way more freight coming north than there is going south. And so it's a lot cheaper to give you a discount moving that back in. So you can kind of bake that in as a round trip rate where you can kind of be like, hey, here it comes back um, on that piece of it. Um, other parts, a lot of it is, you know, in terms of a pricing function, just making sure the network is balanced. And so same as uh, in the truckload market, if you're sending a truck, you know, inbound to Miami, um, nine months out of the year is usually the most expensive truckload price. And then outbound is the cheapest because you know, there's just not as much freight coming out and you got to drive, you know, 600 miles to get out um, before you see anything. The same kind of concept exists for Mexico, but in general, uh, you know, rail is connects major metro to major metro. So there's much more likely to be balanced than it is um, just going to population centers. Um, and it's, uh, so I don't know if I answered that question, but yeah. You'll you get it in. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Cool. We have time for maybe one more question or two, but I'm, I'd like to take one from the chat if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So, so Mac is all in on the CPK, CPKC. Yes. Do you anticipate competition from other? I don't know if you call yourself a three PL, but uh, yeah, yeah. So again, we're um, 
Mexa, we do a hundred million dollars in revenue. And right now, very little of that is intermodal, yeah. right? In terms of on our own equipment. Um, but as a broker, like we're happy for that volume to go on Schneider or anyone else that'll work with us and we can resell that. So if you've got a hundred boxes and I can find some freight for some of them and you can't, like we're happy to, to work with anybody as sort of a neutral party. And kind of how we're looking at our fleet is where does that fit in for specific shippers? Where's kind of that, that niche there? That's why we have reefer equipment instead of dry boxes. Yeah. Um, a little more specialized, a little more expensive. Um, people are a little less willing to send that into Mexico. Yeah. Um, so it's just finding areas. Um, you know, we're, we're, brokerage is really in our DNA. Um, that's that's how we always are, are probably going to approach things, whether that's the right app mentality or not. Um, but it's just finding, you know, the shipper is going to find the best solution anyway. Can we be the ones to bring the best solution to them? Okay. Um, I think maybe we'll just... One last question, uh, is high-speed rail exclusively focused on passenger traffic or are there future possibilities for freight movement, the intermodal to be integrated with those networks? So um, I think Japan, I imagine. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if you want uh, the weights of a train yeah. being suspended by magnets. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's same concept of like 80,000 pounds. It's like, um, but the, uh, I mean, those things are cool. I would love to go to Japan and be on one of those bullet trains. Yeah. They're, they're amazing. Um, the uh, but I, I think that, you know, um, for the speeds that they're going and the relative time and also for hours of service regulation for um, drivers, yeah. you know, the longer the, the distance goes, the rail is really competitive both on price and well, very competitive on price, but also competitive on transit time. Um, the short haul is, is where it gets a little mm -hmm. trickier because the truck is going to go on the road faster. Um, so it's uh, it just, you know. Long hauls always make a lot of sense. As you get more and more efficient, the routes that make sense get shorter and shorter. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, we still have an open bar. Thank you all for coming, Rob. Great job.